now I want to clarify what we mean when we talk about the system and environment. And after we do that, we'll go back to that diagram we started to draw with the pairs of forces, because the final step of that diagram is to actually show what is your environment and what is your system. So first we need to define those. So system are the objects that you are actually calculating. And I say calculating, but another way to think about this is analyzing. It can be qualitative. It doesn't need to be quantitative. So those are the objects that you are analyzing. The environment is the stuff outside. And in this case, I don't mean outside your window. I mean outside of your system. So I want to give you a concrete example that might help with this if you haven't encountered this terminology before. Imagine that I have a person pushing a box and I want to analyze what's happening. Now I have a choice of what I define my system to be. I could define my system to be the box. I could choose my system to be the person and the box. If I wanted to, I could define the system to be my person, the box, and the floor. Notice that the floor is connected to the rest of Earth. So if I wanted to contain this, I would actually want that to probably be all of Earth. In general, in physics class, you don't want to consider the entire Earth as being part of your system. There will, of course, be a few cases where that's not true, but usually we don't want to analyze what's happening to the Earth. So let's choose the person and the box to be my system. What that means is that the Earth is my environment. And again, had I chosen the box only to be my system, the person would have been part of my environment. So what we then notice is that we do have two objects, right? I have my person and I have my box. And so if I start to analyze my forces, I note that they are interacting here. So my person and my box are interacting. I'm going to have some forces there. But I also notice that my person is interacting with the Earth and that my box is interacting with the Earth. And what do those interactions look like? Well, I have gravity, which doesn't even require them to be in contact, but they happen to be. Because they are in contact, I also have a normal force. And I also have a frictional force. So in this case, I have three forces that are actually due to my system interacting, or three categories of forces, due to my system interacting with the environment. And I have one pair of forces within my system due to different objects in my system interacting with each other. Going back to that diagram I started to draw before, we now actually finish it by labeling what the system is. So we draw a box that actually says, what is my system? And we can have objects that are external to the system, such as my earth, or say surface, but we don't consider those part of the system. What that means is we don't have to draw a free body diagram for those. So for the person, what we are going to do is go back and actually draw that interaction diagram. So again, that's what we call this, an interaction diagram. And so I said that there was one force that was within my system connecting my person and my crate. I had used B for, before for box, but hopefully you follow. Now, one thing that the book does differently um, that might make more sense is it actually separates out my environment into two pieces, in this case the surface and the earth separate. And I had kind of considered those the same thing on the previous, uh, the previous slide, and there's nothing wrong with that. So again, we have the surface interacting with each of these via the normal force, and then we have the surface interacting with each object in my system via the friction force. And then because gravity is separate, sorry, I'm sorry, the Earth, right, note the EE here is for entire Earth, 
that you then have a gravity interaction as well. So those are the three forces that I said each of my objects has that is actually due to the environment. And then you have one force which is due to them interacting with each other. So why might you do this? Why might you actually draw an interaction diagram? It's helpful to identify all of the forces that you need to worry about and to identify clearly to yourself what is and is not part of your system. And that's going to matter for when we start drawing free body diagrams. So this is a helpful way to identify what's in your system, what is not in your system, and where your forces are. The other reason is that whenever you have a force that is entirely within your system, right? Look at this push force. This means that you have your pair. You should see both forces that are an action-reaction pair. They are, act, they are acting on different objects. They have different agents, but their magnitude is equal, their direction is opposite. For any of these forces where it's actually leaving the system and going into the environment, you don't have a pair. Now, just to clarify, there is still a reaction force, but the reaction force would be acting on your surface. It would be acting on the Earth. And since those aren't part of your system, you're not actually drawing free body diagrams for them. So on your free body diagram, you only see one of them. And again, that's because the reaction force is on an object that you're not considering. So that's the value of these interaction diagrams. Working through drawing this is a helpful way for you to actually know what are the forces, what are the objects, do you actually have a, a pair entirely on your free body diagram or not.